everyone. I'm Christine Escobar, and I'm the founder and editor of Represent Classical. And this evening, I'm speaking with the founder and artistic director of the Philam Music Foundation, Victor uh, Santiago Asuncion, and several of the foundation's roster of young musicians. The Philam Music Foundation's mission is to encourage Filipino classical musicians through scholarship assistance and performance opportunities. The foundation collaborates with presenting organizations and independently organizes concerts in a wide range of venues, including concert series, schools, government, and community settings. The organization awards scholarships to deserving young Filipino musicians for the purpose of education and career development. Um, so I'm really happy to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, if you wouldn't mind just uh, going around and saying just a brief something, uh, some introduce yourself and just say a little something about, about yourself. Can you hear me? Victor, do you want to start? <laughs> hi. Uh, so, hi, I'm Victor. Thanks for organizing this, uh, Christine. It's so good to see everyone. Um, I, you know, I wish it was in person, but I guess we'll have to make do with this for now. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I, I'm Victor and I, you know, uh, organized the, or I, I, I guess it was my idea to come up with this little foundation as a, a way of of giving back um to uh um everyone that helps me along the way um to help me achieve um everything that i've achieved in, in my musical career uh so it's uh you know just paying it forward so yeah that's about it <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and what year was the foundation uh, what year was it founded the organization uh, 2018 not too long ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think I met you. Um, I met you in 2019. Right. At one, of the, one of the first. I don't yeah. know if it was one of the first. One of the first performances in Evanston, anyway. I think. Right. Exactly. I you you and Ezra just kind of you you came in. Uh, I I think it was like a a Beethoven uh, mm -hmm. uh, marathon of some sort. Um, yeah. That that was. It was uh, wonderful. Was amazing yeah. to to <laughs> meet you know you guys. So. Um, Ezra, do you want to, you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm Ezra. Um, I'm a cellist, um, and I'm a young artist with the foundation. Um, and I go to school at the Manus School of Music in uh, New York. Um, and most of my sort of stuff that I do when we're not in quarantine, I guess, is, uh, up there, um, doing cello and then also doing a little bit of composition, um, sort of anything I put my mind to, I guess, but yeah. Um, I'm Jay. I am a violist uh, by training. I am playing a lot more violin than viola some days now, which is very interesting. Um, I recently got my master's degree at the Juilliard School, recently being last year. <laughs> but, and uh, since August of 2020, I've been serving as one of four LA Orchestra Fellows um, with the LA Chamber Orchestra. Um, the Inner City Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles, and um, also at USC Thornton, where I'm doing a graduate diploma. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm also a cellist, um, like Ezra, and like Jay, I also graduated from my master's um, last year online. <laughs> um, yeah, which was really interesting, but we got through it. Um, I currently serve as a teacher for um, Rock Music, which is a nonprofit organization based in Rochester that um, basically we give lessons to need-based families. And I also um, teach at the Hawk Sands School of Music right now. And I'm just waiting for auditions to start up again so we can get to performing. So, yeah. Hello, my name is Adrian. Um, I'm a violinist. I'm a sophomore at Manis. And I'm studying with Louis Kaplan and Ibn Lee. And right now I'm in the Philippines. <laughs> what time is it right now there? It's it's pretty early, right? Yeah, it's uh, 7.50. 7 a.m., yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. my goodness. Thank you so much for waking up early to talk with us today. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm Carla. I'm a third year clarinetist, also at the Mana School of Music. Um, since the pandemic sort of been happening, I've kind of been looking for any outlet to possibly perform, even if it's online. 
Um, I'm a cleric, I guess, now at the New York Youth Symphony and also their chamber program. And I'm just doing a whole bunch of master classes to fill up my time. <laughs> so, Victor, I want to ask you a little bit more about the foundation um, and what are some of the ways that the foundation supports and helps young musicians develop um, through their uh, through their initiatives, through the initiatives of the foundation? Um, well, recently, I, um, despite the pandemic, we managed to uh, help uh, you guys <laughs> um, to to attend, um, you know, uh, a master class or festival, um, like for example, the the International Cello Institute that happened um, last December, um, and we're hoping that we can send you guys again this summer uh, to do something with them. Um, and um, Carla um, was able to attend. Um, this clarinet, uh, was it just clarinet or it was a... Uh... Yeah, it was like a clarinet intensive week of like just master classes and... Right, yeah. Yeah. With Anthony, <laughs> with Anthony like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no less, yeah. Um, and then Adrian has had um, a lesson uh, with uh, one of, uh, you know, um, leading violinists, I guess, uh, really actively performing right now, Philippe Quint, who also happens to be based in Chicago uh, and mm -hmm. is married to one of the principal dancers of the Joffrey, uh, who's Filipina, uh, Christine uh, Rojas. So, um, and we're, we're I'm, I'm working on getting him a lesson with the concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony. Um, and, you know, just kind of like building some connections for everyone. I haven't done anything for Jay, <laughs> but he is incredibly busy. He's like all over, all over the internet. So he's, uh, yeah, he should be the one helping us. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your organization, Sound Up? You have been really busy with that. And um, mm -hmm. There's been a, a lot of really great uh, concerts and initiatives going on. I've, I've attended a few of those and it's been, they're, they're really wonderful. But thank you. Um, <laughs> now I'm worried. I don't know if, if being all over the internet is necessarily a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were, uh, <laughs> there, have, there have certainly been um, a lot of, uh, there's been a decent amount of, of press on sound off and i'm really grateful of course to uh, represent classical has been so supportive um we've been putting on concerts um involving members of the new york city music community uh basically putting on shows and workshops and raising money for bail funds and other allied organizations uh also had uh, some master classes um certain professors have just donated their time and wanted to like uh improve the visibility of that uh of, of the program and so it's been really great to have some buddies also on this call <laughs> play for stuff. Um, it's been it's been a really great time. Um, yeah, that being said, it does take up a lot of my time. And, uh, you know, I, I am very much looking forward to in person days uh, where hopefully we're not going to be spending all of our time on Zoom and that's going to be taking up a little bit, uh, you know, less of my time because, as we all know, Zoom is a difficult platform. <laughs> <laughs> to uh to be hosting events and concerts over um yeah i really can't wait for in-person concerts to resume especially with phil m um although i am curious how um things are gonna work out with us being so displaced um but i'm really excited to see what happens we're gonna come to you <laughs> yeah filipinos in la what a, what a new idea how novel yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> um yeah, I, I mean, I can imagine it's just like it, we're just waiting at this point for summer and it's just we're just almost at that finish line. It can't come soon enough. Um, so my next question is a little bit more about um, the sort of like the, the state of, of what's happening right now in the industry, classical music, um, certainly over the last year, the classical music industry has kind of come face to face with a turning point um, when it comes to issues of racism and prejudice and and um, just you know sort of a white centered European uh, focus. Um, do you does 
you know, for, for this is a, a question for the group. Um, do you think it's still viable for um, black, brown, indigenous people of color, uh, Asian Americans to carve out a place for themselves within the established industry? Or should they focus more on creating new spaces where they can be better included? Uh, this is, of course, a question I've been thinking about for a really long time. Um, you know, and I'm very grateful to have had a, you know, a surprising degree of success in, in industry. <laughs> um, yeah, where I have at times been, uh, you know, marginalized, at times been, you know, very much accepted with open arms. Um, it is very much dependent on the situation. And, you know, I'm, I, I, of course, I'm very grateful for every space that is centering you know like asian voices or voices of people in a <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh no don't be what's his name that's wolfie oh. <laughs> <laughs> wolf yeah. is mozart <laughs> oh yes yeah mozart's ready <laughs> ready for this spiel um you know i i really do believe first of all that um you know we we, we came to this art form because we found it really beautiful and we were good at it. I'm not really interested in being pushed out, so to speak. Um, and I, I do believe that there is a lot of power in um, us, you know, basically reclaiming these spaces that, um, you know, all, while they might not have been built for us and while, you know, at, at times <laughs> they've been built on top of us. I, you know, I, I think back to a, a lot of research that's been done about, um, you know, Dutch orchestras of Southeast Asian people where they, you know, literally had like basically a, a slave orchestra play for them. And, um, you know, we root that back to like the music of Handel or like people who made money off of the transatlantic slave trade during Mozart's time and funded his stuff. Um, you know, we, we can't put that away. But also, I, I think if we, um, you know, shut ourselves away from it, then there's actually a lot that um, is lost. You know, we can't. How, how can we get justice? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's important um, basically to have both kinds of spaces where, you know, where people of color are free to move within spaces that are, you know, that have been historically white controlled and also for us to have our own spaces. You know, I, th I think there's a lot of like ideas floating around about like how to <laughs> how to like eventually make like a, a space that's that works for everybody but mm -hmm. you know it takes time to base to decolonize you know the buzzword of 2020 um when colonization has lasted for hundreds of years <laughs> you know we, we kind of have to have real expectations talking more about a little bit about um music education and this is probably a question for um some of the artists who have also taught um how can filipino identity be better represented in music education and how could educators increase visibility and acceptance of filipino americans in the world of art and music i think maybe um i'll jump in here uh, for a second um i recently uh completed suzuki method training um in the past couple months and um, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, conversation around this um, because a lot of music education is, as we know, very um, white dominated in terms of repertoire, in terms of um, even like uh, technique and 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 how we actually learn how to play. Um, so for me, I think um, personally, one of the ways in which I sort of uh, try to connect more with my students and help them and le uh, to learn and to uh, to kind of discover more about their instrument is um, I think the repertoire is a great place to start um, because cello repertoire, uh, for example, is extremely European. Um, and, uh, you know, there are amazing pieces out there by Asian, Asian composers, Asian American composers, um, that are pretty easy for kids. And so sometimes instead of giving them, you know, like a regular Suzuki piece or something like that, you could give them the Romanza by Nicola, Nicanor Abelardo or something like that. So I think the repertoire is a really good place to start. 
I guess we could, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, being Asian American in music. Do you, um, do you find yourselves sometimes being typecast as the overachieving musician? You know, there's a lot of common stereotypes in music. Um, and of course in life in, in, in other, in other facets of society in the U S. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing, I think, um, for Filipino Americans, um, because of their sort of mixed cultural heritage. Um, but, but I guess my question is, um, you know, throughout, throughout, uh, throughout your career or your education, um, do you ever find yourselves being sort of typecast? Um, so I'm a mix. My dad is white and my mom is obviously Filipino. And what comes with that is a very mixed reactions depending on what institution I'm in. <laughs> and it's so weird, like on SATs, like to mark everything and applications to know where you fit. Because I know my dad didn't mean any harm. But when I went to like my audition for Juilliard's music advancement program, and you know, before I didn't know Juilliard's name, but he did. He didn't put that I was Asian. He put that I was white in fear that like, if I was Asian, they wouldn't accept me because they wanted to expand or at least that was what was going around. So when I came into the audition room, they were kind of taken aback because they're like, oh, you're not white. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, well, I'm a mix. And it's weird because even when I am, when I say I'm Asian, like when I go into a room full of Asians, they don't see me that way. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, trying to find my own place within the sphere of classical music because I don't know where exactly I fit into it yeah that's interesting yeah um do you think that um just along those lines do you think that being of mixed race has kind of informed your music musicianship and like had an influence on your selection of repertoire yeah I mean to be honest like the clarinet repertoire compared to pianists and strings are very small. <laughs> so when I look outside, I usually transpose my music from cellist music, actually, because I love the cello, it's so beautiful. Um, so I usually try to find my music outside of there. Um, one of my classmates actually re really inspired me because she's from Croatia and she got partnered with like a Croatian composer. And she's like trying to like expand her repertoire and bring some culture back into interwoven. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Like, I would love to sit down, either me, myself do it, like have influences of Filipino music and of course, I guess European, I'm, or I'm not gonna say white, <laughs> um, and just try to find my own voice through music because I love it, but I just don't feel like I exactly know where I belong, you know? I wanna take it back and be like, this is me, you know? And this is my voice. Hopefully that can happen. I had to get better at composing or I had to meet someone who's good at composing <laughs> and kind of just throw things at them. But I think that would be really cool just to bring awareness that like, even though I am mixed, that doesn't mean I'm less than one race or the other. Like I'm both. And I don't think people understand that enough. What do you think Ezra, um, also being mixed race? Yeah, well, I mean, um, being, being mixed race, I think um, a lot of times a lot of people will uh, associate it with sort of like um, like an ongoing search for identity. Basically, you can't really figure out, um, like Carla said, where you where you belong. Um, and I mean, it does tie into to to how you play as well because you do feel like when you're learning how to how to play and and learning how to how to how to just navigate classical music um you do have to develop your own identity but a lot of times being mixed race it's it's and especially being um mixed with filipino which is not represented that much in classical music it's very difficult to sort of um find you know reference points like people that are like you in the industry that you can look up to um that you can take inspiration and influence from um, and also like expressing yourself within the music because you are going to uh, have come into contact with tons of different like um, tons of different 
types of music, you know, styles, ways of expression and stuff um, when you're mixed race. And, and a lot of times, um, especially in classical music, that's not so encouraged to sort of break the mold and, and try to do something different or, or try to bring something, bring a whole bunch of different things in to the fold. So yeah, it's definitely um, a very nebulous sort of uh, existence sometimes, yeah. My next question is um, probably for Victor and Adrian, um, having uh, been raised in the Philippines and being able to, you know, study and perform classical music both there and in the U.S. Um, what would you say, uh, how would you compare the Philippine classical music uh, world to classical music in the U.S. As, in terms of uh, audience engagement and opportunities? I'll let Adrian take that one. <laughs> um, in the Philippines, it's, I don't know, it's like, like the classical music world here, it's really tiny and like everyone knows each other and it's not that like um, supported that much by the society, like especially um, like before, like maybe in like, like 30, 40 years ago, it was better. But now it's like, I don't know, there's like this stigma, like it's only for like rich people and and I don't think that's true. And I think like it should be, because like the education here, like they don't take the music that seriously. Like what they teach is like in the schools is like, it's like, really wrong like if you see the textbooks it's like wrong and they don't care like the government doesn't care that much about it it's interesting that you you actually say like 30 or 40 years ago it was a lot better um it's funny because uh i mean I, i've been in this country for for now um 27 years um, and, and the reason why I left the Philippines is because I felt like there was absolutely no support. Um, at age 19, I was kind of like, um, I was finished. I had won all the, the competitions that I could win. Um, I played with the two orchestras that were around at that point, and I was old news. <laughs> so, um, and I could not find any type of, of scholarship to get out of there. Um, and so I had to kind of like plan my own little escape. Um, so in, in my case, there was, yeah, I mean, um, I, there, there were like uh, some of my contemporaries that, you know, absolutely had support from, mm -hmm. you know, from, the, the right people. I just happened to not fall in with the, the <laughs> with with those people. So I had to kind of like you know um, pave my own path to you know get out of there and 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 uh, pursue a career outside of the Philippines because like Adrian said, it's it's such a small um, community and <laughs> it's not necessarily friendly sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, the competition is absolutely uh, cutthroat, and it can also be like a very crab mentality kind of, uh, uh, you know, like if you're succeeding, we're gonna pull you down, kind of thing. So it's like the only, <laughs> the only um, option is to get out and mm -hmm. and forge your own path outside. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, it's it's very interesting uh it 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 used to bother me a lot more <laughs> but now it's kind of like you know i just mm -hmm. you know i i i have an easier time kind of like stepping back and and kind of like watching them you know fight over 
um, like you know, maybe a piece of bacon <laughs> or something, you know? So, yeah. So in your opinion, it hasn't really changed quite that much at all from what you're seeing, at least from, 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 from what you, from, from those people, the people that you know in the Philippines still well, are just, you know, um, it, what's really interesting is, you know, like what Adrian was saying that, you know, music is viewed as something that's just for rich people. Mm -hmm. um, and yet when you look at the majority of, of the kids that are in um, the music schools, um, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily from, you know, um, well off uh, families. And, and you'll see that a lot of them will um, jump on the opportunity, um, like working in a ship, like being a, you know, a, a, a band musician on, on a boat, mm -hmm. you know, and like, um, or they go to Disney uh, in Hong Kong or in Japan or wherever, or they go to Macau um, mm -hmm. and play in a, a lot of those casinos. Um, and, you know, these are, are kids that went to conservatory. <laughs> so, um, and they, they go out there, um, to, to make a living. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a very interesting situation. Definitely. Yeah. It sounds like there's not, there's just not a lot of opportunities no. within, you know? Yeah. And there are at least 10 <laughs> orchestras right now. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> there's, there's so many of them. Um, yeah, it's, it's really incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, back when I was there, there were two. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and every university, um, at least, you know, from my, uh, you know, I, I think every single university has a music school, <laughs> you know? So it's mm -hmm. like, um, yeah, we, we got like boatloads of, um, of music students all right studying. of talent yeah right absolutely yeah um so for the undergrads um as emerging artist um what does it mean to you to have the support um that the foundation provides as you embark on your careers and as you develop um throughout your throughout your musicianship um you know what is that um how does that feel to just to just have that to have that support i can go um so having the foundation support is really nice it feels like i've been accepted um back when i was in high school there was another filipino group um called couples for christ um and it was just like all of the Filipinos from Long Island would just flock to it. And of course they grew up together and it was so nice, but I didn't. And I entered the group new and I was like, I don't know, I was kind of like ostracized almost. I wasn't really like within the group. I didn't, I don't speak. Um, so that kind of doesn't help my case, but I just felt really alone. I didn't think that I would be accepted within my own heritage. Like I know my family back in the Philippines, like love me so dearly but when I go there of course it's like it's weird like it's hard to interact at first until like maybe a few days like I can come in and I'll be like hi like it's fine so when I was invited by Ezra to come see the foundation it's like it's concert for the first time I was a little scared I was a little intimidated I was like am I Filipino enough <laughs> to be here <laughs> because I didn't know and I I was kind of quiet and I was like I don't feel like I belong here. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. But that was quickly changed once I talked to Victor. Like, I felt like I was recognized not only as a Filipino, but as a musician and as a person. And I was like, I was never <laughs> seen like this before. And to know that, like, if I need something, I could reach out and be like, hey, I have this master class. Like, it's a little expensive. Like, would you mind? It's nice to know that. I can pursue my dreams, you know, and not be like totally scared of like what to do. So it's it's nice to feel supported. Um, I'm not an undergrad. I am. I finished my master's, but that is um, correct. Yeah, but um, I do have to say that having the foundation support has made me feel stronger. 
because um, I grew up in San Diego and it's home to an incredibly vibrant Filipino community. But I, I, I spent 12 years in San Diego Youth Symphony and I was the only Filipino musician for so long. That's crazy. It's 750 students in San Diego and I'm the only Filipino musician. And so I just spent, I mean, I, I'm not of mixed race, but I wanted to chime in earlier talking about how growing up, I'm first generation American. And so growing up, I had to experience the duality of cultures. Um, at home, I was Filipino and we watched endless telenovelas. Um, my Lola would prepare so many like, you know, day long stews, caricares, sinigang. But at school, I was American. But I wasn't, I don't speak Tagalog, so I never felt Filipino enough. And when I was at school, I, I mean, I live in a, like I live in San Diego, which is very Filipino, like there's a ton of Filipinos, but where I live specifically, there are not many. So I, I felt like I also didn't fit in at school. Um, but yeah, and then I went to my undergrad school and I went to Eastman for my undergrad. And I think there were only four Filipinos my entire time I was there, four years. And so um, when I, when Queer Victor reached out and was talking about the Filipino American Music Foundation, I was like, wow, finally, like there is some representation, some visibility, like some people to relate to. And yeah, it was just having the support makes me feel, uh, yeah, it makes me feel like a stronger musician. Well, I'm certainly not an undergrad, but, <laughs> um, but, Throughout my education um, in in the United States, like every single school that I went to, I was always the only Filipino, <laughs> and I, and, you know, I would always like have to find, you know, I I, I happened to 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 work with a lot of um, uh, South Koreans, so like I kind of like got adopted <laughs> into the South Koreans, and then you know like the a bunch of Chinese um, instrumentalists that I played with also adopted me, but there was never, you know, any representation. So I felt like I'm, you know, I was confused. I'm a native Filipino, um, mm -hmm. not really American, but there was no one to, to really kind of, you know, um, identify with. Um, so I'm, I was kind of like my, the sole flag bearer of, of my, <laughs> My own nationality, so uh, you know. I mean, maybe it's just a sign of the of the times. But I'm I'm so incredibly excited that you guys are all kind of like in the same school, or you know, you were in the same <laughs> city at, at one point, um, and you get along. You know, I mean, back when I was here, uh, like as a you know as a student, there was this weird competition too, like. Um, you know, like there were other pianists that were studying elsewhere, like also Filipino uh, pianists that were studying elsewhere in the United States. And instead of us kind of like coming together, it was more like um, cat fight. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it was like a fight over the very limited resources that we had. And for the longest time, there's only just one pianist, Cecile Likai, um, you know, because she had the benefit of um, the, the influence of Imelda Marcos. Um, so she, all the gates and all the doors and windows, everything opened up for her. Um, but the rest of us had to kind of like, you know, forge our own little paths. Um, hence the, the stiff comp competition, even though there were like three or four of us um, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the country. <laughs> so you'll hear like, you know, I mean, I when I became a professor um, at a university in, in, in Tennessee, I would hear things um, uh, like a, a fellow Filipino pianist who was based in, in New York City, who shall remain nameless, um, would badmouth me, um, like to the students that wanted to come study with me. Uh, and they would say like, oh, you're gonna go to the States, but you're gonna study with Victor? What's the point? You know, so that was, you know, it was kind of like, wow, we were, you know, kind of like shooting ourselves in our own, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, 
I, I yeah, that that was a, a big frustration for me. Um, and not having like, you know, uh, support of my yeah. own fellow Filipino musicians. I think one of the most like important things that's kind of changed recently is communication um, between all you know, Filipinos, Filipino Americans, um, stuff like that. I think that's something really important that's kind of been brought up now with the foundation with sort of like you were saying, yeah, like the the just because yeah, we're we're a really big population group, but we never, I don't think we ever realized how big we were. Um, and so like communication, like keeping up with each other and knowing what everybody's doing, like it it it's a like a a cycle, it self-reinforces and it and it it allows you to, you know, collaborate and to continue to work towards new things and 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 you know draw on each other and and yeah, I think that that's and with the foundation especially, that's something that's really, I think, one of the best parts about it is that we're all in touch and we're all we're all in tune with what everybody else is doing. But yeah, I mean, you you have a. It's great to have this growing community, you know, of of support and just to to you know like the visibility that 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 you're out there and that you are you know making a difference and making an impact. Right, like a larger community. It sounds like there was a lot of. Um, just sort of competing for very limited opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you know, and it's funny because I was reading, you know, like just, just reading about Asian America, like in over the last few weeks, just kind of just understanding a lot more about just a lot of different facets of things. Um, and, you know, I was really surprised to find out that Filipinos are the second largest Asian American group in the U.S. And I actually wrote that down in my notes because it was just like so significant because um, the Wikipedia entry says that there's there's an estimated 18 million, like 18, 18 million Asian Americans living in the US and 4 million of them are Filipino Americans. So it's interesting. There's like, it's a huge population. Um, and, you know, but to see like Amanda, like you were saying, to just see like just four people <laughs> in your college and just to, you know, just be to be the only person for how many years, it's interesting. But but yeah, I think gradually, um, you know, in my work most recently over the last couple of years when I was with a, a, a local youth conservatory, um, there were a lot more uh, Filipino American families starting to just really commit to, you know, being in classical music and, and and it was really nice to see because um, and and like Ezra you know um, has 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 talked about with with Manus that there's just a just a, a nice population of Filipino American musicians there and it, it just seems to be growing. Okay. Um, I guess my last question would be um, what's next for the foundation um, in terms of you know uh, your future plans. I know it's really difficult to really under you know kind of to kind of estimate what 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 could happen in the next year right. or so but yeah so i've uh I, it was heartbreaking but i had to um approach uh carnegie hall and and just mm -hmm. basically ask them for for a refund <laughs> for mm -hmm. for our um yeah we had been planning this really you know big uh celebration of filipino musicians um you know that was for for last year and mm -hmm. um they made the announcement that this summer it's still going to be closed mm -hmm. um so what we're trying <laughs> to do right now is basically um we're cooking something up um to do something in in evanston um mm -hmm. something similar to what um musicians in new york are doing right now like which is storefront concerts mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. so we're looking for a venue um that's in downtown evanston um and you know because of obviously the pandemic like we kind of like need that separation um mm -hmm. but we also need a, a, a you know a place that's public enough that where people can you know be exposed to um to classical music so that's one that we're exploring and we're also, um, uh, we are kind of like expanding um, our uh, 
territory, I guess, so to speak. Um, we're uh, uh, reaching out to uh, the communities in Florida um, and we're hoping to start a, a concert season there since they seem to be more open <laughs> at this point. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, and it, scarily so, but, um, but you know, we, we have to take advantage of it. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, um, cause I, New York right now is just kind of like such a hot spot that right just, right uh, yeah and vaccinations aren't quite as quick as as, as right. they hoped I guess there you know right exactly so that's we're we're, we're aiming like in that direction and um it's so hard to plan anything it it really right. absolutely is I mean we um like last summer we had that outdoor um, festival that we are mm -hmm. still hoping to have again this summer, but everyone's schedules is, you know, kind of like up in the air. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just gonna basically, you know, do something at very last minute, hopefully yeah. not so last minute that we can actually uh, um, encourage people uh, to attend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but yeah other than that i mean i i'm not terribly um technologically <laughs> advanced so um i mean you know like we we've done some uh virtual things but i don't know how successful they were um and i i remember when i did the 12 hour thing i mean <laughs> we did raise some money like about uh I think close to five thousand um, dollars that we did raise, which helped, you know, uh, with, with some of the things that we were able to do um, for you guys. So, um, but in terms of the quality of, mm -hmm. of the, the broadcast, like I mean, I got shut down by Facebook, and you know, it was just it was it was difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 the only other option right now that I can think of is like to pre-record um, everything in a studio, which I've been doing for other um, chamber music uh, series, um, but they cost so much money. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, uh, yeah, so it's kind of yeah, like- it's a, it's a trade off, right, yeah. It, and then there's a whole, like you were saying, there's a whole other skill set that you have to have to do right. all of that right. stuff yeah, and then to exactly. stream and whatnot. So, yeah, so we're, so right now we're focusing on, you know, like just trying to, to find the budget to, to help you guys. Like, kind of like if, if you find a festival or something that, you know, like a virtual thing that you want to attend, then, you know, just kind of like reach out to me and we'll see what we can do. Um, Cause there's, there's really not a whole lot we can do at this mm -hmm. moment. So, yeah. So we're just all, you know, hanging in there, I guess. Exactly, right, right. right. Well, thank you everybody for um, joining me for this discussion. It's been really great to talk with you and to learn more about what you've been doing and, and just, you know, just talk about all the different things that we've been discussing here. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck. And um, I'll be sure to put your links to your pages in the description for the video. Um, and I guess that's it. So, but thank you, everyone, and best of luck with everything. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. It's great seeing you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.